Hello, my name is Jonathan Rosa. I'm excited to have the opportunity to share with you all at the Official Languages and Bilingualism Institute at the University of Ottawa. My presentation today is focused on my research related to race and language broadly, but specifically the article Unsettling Race and Language Toward a Raciolinguistic Perspective, which my close colleague Nelson Flores and I published in the journal Language and Society in 2017. Part of what inspired this article was our frustration with the ways that assumptions about race and language were often framed in relation to the idea that ethno-racial categories and linguistic varieties correspond directly to one another. And that as sociolinguists, as linguistic anthropologists, applied linguists, educational linguists, critical language scholars generally, our job is to continually assert the legitimacy of marginalized populations language practices and to prove over and over and over all of the different ways in which stigmatized populations language practices are actually quite skillful, quite valuable and meaningful and to try to demonstrate that in many as many ways as possible. And I think uh, for Nelson and me, we felt deeply unsatisfied by this approach, even if we understood and respected and wanted to honor why previous generations of scholars felt as though it was important to focus on this kind of work. We felt as though in this moment, we needed a different vision. And in fact, we turned to some thinking from various scholars and philosophers and activists and um, uh, uh, creative writers um, to figure out their take on the nature of this endemic problem of race. And so we, for example, took great inspiration from the thinking of Toni Morrison, who had this to say nearly 50 years ago. The function, the very serious function of racism, which is distraction. It keeps you from doing your work. <clears throat> It keeps you explaining over and over again your reason for being. Somebody says you have no language and so you spend 20 years proving that you do. Somebody says your head isn't shaped properly so you have scientists working on the fact that it is. Somebody says that you have no art so you dredge that up. Somebody says you have no kingdoms and so you dredge that up. None of that is necessary. There will always be one more thing. Part of what was so interesting to me about this analysis is the suggestion that we could very easily end up inadvertently participating in a project that it, it would ultimately um, would ultimately be inadequate uh, in terms of addressing the fundamental problem that is race, which is to say that uh, um, simply trying to demonstrate that you're just as good as uh, is not uh, an adequate response to racism and to white supremacy um, and, and global imperialism. In fact, uh, we need a, a, a fundamentally different orientation to what's going on here because the bar continually shifts. And in some of my work, I've tried to show how certain populations are framed as having no language uh, and then in another moment, they're framed as not having the right language. So as soon as we recognize they have language, they don't have the right language. And then in another moment, it's that they don't have the right variety of the right language. And I think that's when Toni Morrison says there will always be one more thing, it demonstrates the ways that, wait, if, if uh, uh, simply trying to demonstrate that marginalized populations have as much language or language that's as good as some imagined norm, if that's incomplete, then what should we be focusing on instead? And so that's that thinking is really what inspired Nelson and me to conceptualize what we call a raciolinguistic perspective. And we've articulated five tenets and we're certainly open to other potential tenets and, and reframings of these as well. But uh, the colonial production, the co-naturalization of language and race is really central to this work, a focus on perception and on, on listening. So the, the, the hegemonic, the hegemonically positioned perceiver is what we're really interested in rather than the speaking practices, especially of the marginalized subject or the expressive practices of the marginalized subject. We wanna redirect our focus to the perceiver 
rather, rather than the marginalized subject. We wanna think really critically about how these categories of race and ethnicity and language have been co-naturalized to uh, uh, lead us to think that every single ethno-racial category corresponds directly to a discrete set of linguistic forms. And I worry about the ways that uh, in some situations that ends up leading to rubrics that are used to assess populations. In other situations, it leads to the romantic sort of uh, generalization and essentialization of different populations practices that is also concerning for a range of reasons, even if in certain moments we, we might be inclined to traffic in those kinds of essentializations. Thinking critically about race and language, not just in a vacuum, but uh, intersectionally and from an assemblage based perspective. So drawing on black feminist theorizations of intersectionality to think about how uh, uh, racial and gender oppression co articulate in relation to a range of systems of domination. If we're thinking about class and uh, uh, ideas about sort of a, a cis heteropatriarchal structure, a, a, a set of a, a range of, of systems of, of power and how they relate to one another. And lastly, really trying to develop a broader theory of change that isn't simply about trying to modify the behaviors of marginalized populations, but rather trying to interrogate the systems that continually position those populations as deficient. So let's begin with the first principle of a racio-linguistic perspective, which focuses on the colonial co-production of race and language. So we're really interested uh, in the onset of European colonialism in the Americas. Of course, as a US-based scholar, uh, a great deal of my work, my work primarily focuses on the US right now and US imperial territories. Um, so, uh, but, but to be clear, uh, European colonialism has global implications. And so we could explore racio-linguistic ideologies across various contexts. And I'll point to some global contexts uh, as we move forward. Um, so we're thinking about the, uh, an initial stage of, of colonialism, but also leading to nation state formation and the enlightenment and, and trying to understand how these borders that demarcate territories, geopolitical territories, ethno-racial boundaries and linguistic boundaries are produced together and what it means to interrogate that production, uh, what's, at, what's at stake in maintaining those boundaries uh, in relation to one another. So what we want to argue is that if you are focused on language learning and in contemporary institutions, you need to be paying very careful attention to the colonial structures that continue continue to organize those institutions that you inhabit right now and shape the perceptions of language use in them. So if we look historically at the ways that indigenous populations are framed as the, in the Americas as subhuman and inferior and as using uh, non-human animal-like languages based on a sort of presumed hierarchy in which the human is, uh, and the human defined in very normative, masculinist, white Europeanist terms, is the reference point for advancement, for maximal advancement um, as compared to non-human animals and indigenous populations are positioned from this sort of uh, emergent white supremacist perspective as a, a, a subhuman or inferior, inherently inferior population that uses languages that are unintelligible and that prevent indigenous populations from experiencing Christian religious salvation and becoming real people. Subsequently, with the emergence of the Enlightenment, the problem isn't simply that indigenous populations can't be saved, uh, but instead that indigenous populations need to be assimilated into European ways and European languages in order to learn, in order to become fully human. And so uh, we see a reconfigured sort of set of assumptions that on the one hand create institutional projects of assimilation, and on the other hand, relegate indigenous languages to sort of these museum-like positions as needing to be preserved as signs of a past, as a, a relics of a, 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 a historical past, um, or relics of a, a particular kind of dehistoricized history, I guess is the point to say, uh, that is being produced in relation to, pro to profound violence. So uh, that relegation to a past is made possible through genocide, indigenous genocide, alongside projects of forced assimilation. We see subsequently, and this is a, a dramatically abbreviated uh, rendering of what happens in, in the creation of the Americas. Uh, and I've focused primarily 
on uh, anti-indigenous sort of sentiment in that project. Of course, we could look at anti-black sentiment, sentiment as well and its foundational role. And I will point to these examples throughout. Um, we see in the post-colonial moment and the so-called late modern moment, the ways that these colonial ideologies uh, reconfigure and live on and they create reference points for authenticity and legitimacy that are still rooted in these historical sorts of assumptions about populations, uh, colonized populations inferiority. We see again these uh, ideas about what languages are used, uh, are, are understood to be relevant for popular culture, for governance, and what language practices are most relevant for museums uh, and, and as signs of a past. And we also see this kind of catch-22 or double bind, and this is what Franz Fanon and many others have spoken to, the way in which, despite marginalized populations, uh, efforts to access uh, normativity or inclusion or whiteness or class uh, upward socioeconomic mobility um, through the use of particular language practices, those populations can in any given moment uh, have the rug pulled out from under them and be presumed deficient. Uh, and, and race can overdetermine language in powerful ways. And so I'm not just interested in how race shapes language and language shapes race. I think that that often feels like a, a deeply sort of under theorized framing. I'm interested in racial and linguistic overdetermination, and that's a very particular uh, process. And so, in order to understand that process, I want to think about a per perceiving subject uh, as a, a fundamental sort of uh, structurally positioned actor in that process of overdetermination. So, we're building from Miyako Inoue's conceptualization of the listening subject, the, the role of listening subjects in producing sociolinguistic categories, so that these language practices don't just emerge from populations in straightforward ways, at least in terms of the classifications that we currently have for them, that those practices and their classificatory systems, they emerge as parts of ideological perspectives that are rooted in, in the reproduction of structures of power. And we're really trying to figure out the ways that this can challenge our ideas, our assumptions about the empirical nature of language practices, uh, the idea that we can just document what's going on using our existing tools and our existing linguistic categories. We're really interested in broadening the notion of a listening subject uh, to a perceiving subject so that's not just about spoken language or auditory perception uh, but broader modes of expressivity so uh, not just a uh, written or spoken language but also clothing hairstyles all sorts of uh, modalities are subject to racio-linguistic ideologies and finally really moving beyond the notion that racio-linguistic ideologies live in individuals and can be disrupted at that individual level of changing one's views uh, and rather understanding them as structures structures and institutional processes uh, and, and trying to figure out the ways that policies enact and reproduce ideologies, the ways that technologies reproduce and enact ideologies, that uh, uh, institutional categories enact and reproduce uh, ideologies so that we can change everyone's views. And that doesn't necessarily uh, un unsettle those structures as they're enacted across different sorts of entities. Uh, we can look at an example of what Nelson and I frame as a white listening subject in a cartoon like this, which frames language use as this apolitical situation where, you know, I'm not, my assessments of your language are disconnected from ideas about class or gender or race, and I can correct your language use uh, without correcting you as a person. And yet, Ana Celia Zentea, Bonnie Urcioli, and many others have shown us how in a post-civil rights United States, especially, we've seen a remapping of race from biology onto language and culture such that it's uh, illegitimate in many public sorts of mainstream public contexts to frame populations as uh, biologically inferior. Uh, however, populations can be framed as suffering from a so-called culture of poverty or uh, said to lack academic language or standard language. And so these ideas about culture and language and reproduce these sorts of uh, notions about race powerfully. Uh, and, and these attributions of linguistic deficiency uh, articulate in various ways. In some cases, it, they, they become framings of unintelligibility altogether, as we saw in the example of, of Rihanna's uh, uh, song work from several years ago. And Crystal Smalls has written about powerfully about the anti-Blackness that informs these attributions of uh, unintelligibility. And we see this with essentially every global language um, that becomes linked 
to the African diaspora uh, can be framed as unintelligible or an illegitimate language so that French is no longer French, Spanish is no longer Spanish, and English is no longer English. Essentially, you see these ideologies of pure of European purity that is, is corrupted by Blackness. Uh, and so Crystal is written not just about anti-Blackness, but about emphatic Blackness and, and Black responses to this kind of overdetermination and assertions of a different sort of mode of expression and a different register uh, and a set of value systems, commitments, and, and, and a, a, pol a political vision altogether. We see the power of a listening subject and its capacity to overdetermine over uh, signs, the status of signs, and examples like Match Guy studies that Donald Rubin conducted uh, uh, 30 years ago. Uh, in this case, you show an undergraduate lecture hall full of students, only the image on the left, which is a stereotypical white woman. You play an audio track for the students and you ask them to describe the voice that they hear, and then you give them a, a short quiz based on the information in the audio track. The students who only see the image on the left. They say the voice sounds regular, normal, unremarkable. They fare perfectly well on the quiz. The students who only see the image on the right, a stereotypical Asian woman, and this is a comparable, but a, a different group of students who hear the same exact audio track, but only see the image on the right. They describe the ostensibly same linguistic materials as accented, hard to understand, weird, and they fare less well on the quiz uh, with the same exact information. And so in this case, we can see how, you can think about this in higher education settings, all of the TA trainings that international students face, and especially international students of color uh, who are framed as unintelligible. And yet even when you have the same, ostensibly the same auditory information, it can be perceived as unintelligible or wrong or incorrect or problematic based on these racialized modes of, of filtering and, and, and distortion. But it's not just language. We could see these distortions take place across modalities uh, and various sorts of forms of social life undergo transformation through from the perspective of this cartoonist white vision glasses that turn a phone into that weaponize a, a cell phone into a gun that turns soda into liquor that darken one's skin based on a, a racist colorist logic uh, that turn a book bag uh, into a drug paraphernalia wielding um, wielding uh, device on some on some level. So in this case, uh, you see that it's it, it's language in conjunction, co-articulating semiotically with uh, uh, various forms. And this is why it's important. To, it's crucial uh, not to analyze language in a vacuum uh, and language learning in a vacuum by extension. Uh, we see, so the previous example focused on anti-Black sorts of sentiments. We saw in the case of a young man several years ago who uh, made a clock at home and brought it to school, uh, whose teacher uh, thought that it was a bomb. Um, and, and so this cartoonist, again, um, sort of points to the, the contradictions involved here and the, the discriminatory sentiments involved here that, that, that weaponize particular kids' practices and kids' creativity. And there's a perverse kind of weaponization and, and criminalization of kids of color who never get to be kids, essentially, uh, through these logics. Uh, it, it is tied to language though, right? So the, in, in terms of this representation where he's holding on to the US constitution that's framed as uh, incomprehensible propaganda uh, or as Arabic. And in, in this case, you see very clearly the Islamophobic sentiments um, that are involved in these modes of overdetermination. Uh, technologies can enact racio-linguistic ideologies. And so we see technologies like Siri based on who's designing them and Ruha Benjamin's powerful work around technology, Sophia Noble, various scholars have really been uh, uh, pushing us to consider the ways that racism is enacted through these kinds of technologies and through the producers who created them. Uh, but it's important to attend not just to humans when we're thinking about racio-linguistic ideologies I also want to think about institutions functioning as listening subjects. So thousands of kids in Los Angeles Unified classified as non-non, allegedly non-verbal in English and their so-called native languages. Virtually no human child is a non-non, but these stigmatizing perceptions of kids as fundamentally deficient leads to this sort of designation becoming a, a perfectly acceptable practice in one of the nation's largest school districts. We also see thousands and thousands of kids designated as so-called long-term English learners in US schools. These are kids who have been designated as English learners for 
in many cases six years or more and don't pass the test for reclassification uh, uh, as proficient users of English. And so for many kids, they're the entirety of their K through 12, or for some kids, the entirety of their K through 12 learning experiences, uh, they are designated as English learners, even though English might be the primary language they use. And so we're really trying to, to understand how these sorts of classifications function as listening subjects or as perceiving subjects. The third tenet of a racio-linguistic perspective focuses on the ways that ethno-racial categories are produced and, and, and bundled together in relation to a set of a very specific set of stereotypes about the features um, that, that constitute those categories, uh, that make those categories recognizable in particular ways. And some of those features are language. And so we're really interested in how these linguistic inventories emerge and how it is that in some cases they're celebrated as though they emerged from a, a, a racialized population. Um, and and in, in other cases, they're used against people to frame them as inauthentic, uh, as lacking somehow. So we really want uh, to think critically about these sorts of ideas that naturalize language and race uh, uh, that, that lead us to think that every single ethno-racial group or ethnic or racial group corresponds to a discrete set of linguistic forms. We really want to disrupt this idea. You'd see screeners like this that sociolinguists participated in the creation of that are used in mainstream schools in the US that demonstrate these kinds of inventories and these features that draw these close correspondences between race and, and, and language. In this case, you see a screener for African-American children allegedly helping African-American children to learn so-called standard English, right? And so look at number 17 here. Uh, on the left column, you see the standard English uh, examples. The middle column is the, the uh, examples of potential African-American language responses to those prompts. And on the right column is the problem with the African-American responses that needs to be fixed, allegedly. 17, she uses pen to write. Uh, she uses a pen to write. African-American child allegedly might say pin to write. And that needs to be corrected because it's a problem with vowel pairs or homophones according to this uh, uh, classific classificatory sort of um, um, structure, this, this uh, evaluative uh, uh, tool. No. Vowel pairs and homophones exist uh, across languages, you know, very common. Uh, and so when some people say aunt and other people say aunt, very, you know, we could look at uh, countless examples of this uh, in which millions of people are engaging on a daily basis, yet not framed as linguistically deficient and in need of remediation. But why when black kids uh, it produce particular vowel patterns, do they need to be fixed? This is why I'm worried about uh, discussions of code switching and really celebrations of code switching. And, and we could you know, have a longer conversation about that. Uh, the Mexican-American screener is egregious as well. Number one, don't be bad. A Mexican-American child might produce that as don't be bad uh, they, they, with a particular kind of set of intonation patterns. And the problem here is that Mexican kids sound like they're singing when they speak English and that needs to be fixed. Their intonation needs to be flattened, allegedly. 16, uh, T-H-E apple, a Mexican-American child might alleg allegedly say the apple. And we're supposed to know that uh, T-H-E should be pronounced as the before a word that starts with a vowel. And so I'm not sure if you, uh, you know, for, my, for English users, uh, um, if you were familiar with this, uh, um, with this sort of expected rule before, but uh, I was certainly not familiar with it until I en encountered this screener. Um, so uh, somehow when millions of us use words like the, I, you know, you, it's not a, a problem at all, but when very particular Mexican American children say the, it needs to be fixed. These are conclusions that exist in advance these, uh, uh, of evidence. These are presumptions that are looking for evidence uh, um, to, to, to prove them. And so I'm really, uh, I'm really concerned about the ways that um, these, these kinds of uh, tools are used uh, as though they were helping people benevolently. I really want to think critically about disrupting our ideas about the naturalization of these categories. The fourth point of a uh, fourth tenet of a racial linguistic perspective really focuses on um, uh, uh, locating race and language in relation to various structures of power and systems of power. So of course, thinking from black feminist theorizations of intersectionality 
and uh, uh, theorizations of assemblages of categories of difference as well. And really trying to figure out how embodiment becomes absolutely central to uh, racial-linguistic ideologies, but also how bodies are deceptive in terms of uh, our analysis of, of uh, where race and language come from. Um, and so we want to think critically about um, what we could uh, what we could learn by by looking across axes of difference. Uh, let's look at one example here from a recent uh, a television award show in the United States. Yes, hi, I'm Eva Longoria, not Ava Mendes. And hi, I'm America Ferreira, not Chino Rodriguez. Yes. <laughs> and neither neither one of us are Rosario Dawson. Nope. Well said, Selma. Thank you, Charo. Um... So in this example, the actresses, uh, Eva Langoria and uh, America Ferreira, they're sort of making a joke about the assumption of the stereotype that all Latinas are interchangeable and they're pushing back against that assumption. Uh, and, and yet, uh, right after the award show, MTV Australia tweets out where the English subtitles have no idea what America Ferreira and Eva Longoria are saying. And so MTV Australia is making a joke about this, um, but I'm, I'm interested in the logic that informs the joke. Um, so on the one hand, these women are pushing back against this sort of gendered and racialized assumption about interchangeability. On the other hand, these linguistic sorts of ideas uh, frame them as interchangeable and unintelligible simultaneously, or, or that kind of fundamental attribution of unintelligibility. And so the Rihanna example from earlier is relevant here as well, in terms of that presumed, uh, um, presumed sort of uh, incapacity to communicate uh, in ways that could be understood. See examples here that focus on religion on, uh, and again, Islamophobic sorts of perspectives. Uh, this is a, a math professor who was on his way to give a lecture and his seatmate on a plane thought that the equations he was writing were Arabic and by extension associated with terrorism. This math professor was Italian and uh, at least in the news reports associated with this incident is said to have olive skin. It's interesting to think about the ways that what he was writing, uh, how uh, the language practices in which he was engaging and the perception of those practices from the perspective of a particular perceiving subject transform him into a particular ethno-racial entity and how in some ways you know, his quote unquote olive skin lends itself to that. And in other ways, uh, there are various systems that are articulating um, on the body and around in and outside of the body. Uh, we could look at the ways that class is absolutely central to racio-linguistic ideologies. Uh, look at a, an advertisement like this, which celebrates by, well, commodifies bilingualism. So on the left, you see a lighter skinned man wearing uh, dress clothes of some sort or dressed you know, in a, a shirt and tie relatively formally. It uh, says, can't speak Spanish, you need this book. So it's, uh, uh, the idea is he's an English user who should learn Spanish. So it's promoting uh, Spanish English bilingualism for him. On the right, you see a, a brown skinned man addressed less formally. It says, no habla inglés, you don't speak English. Necesita este libro, you need this book. Uh, and so in both cases, we see the promotion of English Spanish bilingualism, but in the service of the reproduction of a socioeconomic hierarchy. So for the person on the left, learning Spanish helps him to become a better boss. And for the person on the right, learning English helps him to become a better subordinate laborer. And so we wanna be really critical about the ways that our uh, approaches to addressing uh, uh, linguistic stigmatization don't reproduce a capitalist logic and a racist logic at the same time. And so often we see people championing bilingualism as though all bilingualisms were good and the same and were linked to progressive social change. Well, here we see how bilingualism, uh, depending on the broader sort of structural dynamics in relation to which it's being advanced can actually uh, uh, be uh, reproductive of existing sorts of hierarchies. Finally, in my last few minutes, I just want to uh, point to, in some ways, the most important tenet of a racio-linguistic perspective, which focuses on a theory of change uh, that, uh, that uh, approaches the, uh, a system of power in relation to which race and language are produced, 
rather than correcting, attempting to correct racialized subjects uh, or, or racially and, and linguistically stigmatized subjects. Um, and so uh, these, uh, it's, it's pushing back against the sort of behavioral models of, of intervention um, that we see across a range of contexts and really pushing uh, against an inclusion based model and instead putting the onus of change on institutions across scales. So uh, uh, rather than marginalized individuals really thinking about systems. Um, so we, uh, in order to understand the, the sort of normative theory of change that has been incorporated into sociolinguistics, it's important to track the kind of historical production of the field. And so uh, Bonnie McElhenney and Monica Heller's brilliant book, Language, uh, Colonialism, and Capitalism, I might be getting colonialism and capitalism, uh, the order of those mixed up, but those are the three words in the title. Um, they, they document uh, the ways in which the, the, this particular sort of era of, of post-coloniality uh, uh, in the mid uh, to, to late 20th century of post-coloniality, uh, a, um, a, a post-World War II end of legal segregation in the United States, uh, and, and a post-World War II uh, set of shifting migration patterns uh, more broadly in the United States and Europe that lead to questions about how to respond to these, uh, these populations uh, that are associated with particular forms of difference or diversity. What do you do uh, to, to uh, include them? Uh, at least that's the, the normative question from a liberal sort of uh, disciplinary sociolinguistic vantage point. And so there's a commitment to asserting that all languages are fundamentally legitimate and equal and good and valuable, um, while also trying to help people recognize how they can uh, better assimilate or better be included into a given society. So how do you navigate institutions that ultimately privilege very particular practices? So we can assert that all languages are equal and yet institutionally uh, we communicate a very different message. And so many sociolinguists have tried to broker between these perspectives uh, by cre creating particular models of inclusion um, that, that seek our, our, these sorts of asset-based models uh, that seek to validate marginalized populations practices while helping to build a bridge between them and a so-called mainstream society without interrogating uh, the, the fundamental nature of that mainstream society. And so you see the creation of these ideas that seek to affirm a culturally responsive uh, sorts of pedagogies, which on one level make absolute sense and are important parts of, uh, of I think, speaking to people's experiences, but as a, a, an end in themselves, don't necessarily disrupt a, a system. And so we want to think really critically about the limitations of, um, of an effort that sees, uh, that, that sees change uh, as emerging from uh, these efforts towards validation, uh, toward incorporation. And so the idea is if you could validate people better then that helps them to be, or if you validate people in a particular way that helps them to be included better uh, and, and to increase mobility. Again, framing mobility as a behavioral kind of uh, uh, pattern rather than a structural phenomenon. And, and this is why you see uh, incorporated into many of these asset-based approaches, these economic sorts of metaphors around resources and uh, investments and funds of knowledge uh, and assets. And so uh, uh, you see how many of these analyses are devoid of an understanding of political economy um, by and large. And so we wanna think really critically about how racial-linguistic ideologies are rooted within a, a political and economic history that's rooted in a broader history of colonialism. And so a racial-linguistic theory of change is engaging with these broader histories of colonialism and capitalism uh, and, and trying to understand how we can connect our efforts towards producing um, linguistic change or a, 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 a critical kind of linguistic perspective uh, how we could connect that to a broader set of political commitments around uh, what it means to create sustainable ecologies, what it means to create uh, 
job opportunities with living wages, access to housing, access to food as just sort of fundamental human rights, migration as a fundamental human right. So how is it that our language advocacy can be and must be uh, advanced in relation to an anti-imperialist set of commitments, uh, um, a, 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 a set of uh, a set of understandings of the, the traumas and the hierarchies um, that are everyday normalized in relation to a, a, a cis heteronormative patriarchal uh, patriarchal kind of society um, and world. And so um, I think this racial-linguistic perspective is, is really trying to broaden the, the critique uh, and to, to not narrowly accept inclusion uh, as, as the, the response here, because we see the ways that populations are continually made disposable, even if individuals might be included. And so we're really trying to push back against a liberal multicultural model of being uh, included into a melting pot, one of the most violent metaphors I can possibly think of to be boiled and melted into something um, and, and uh, rejecting this sort of notion that what marginalized populations need to do is modify their behaviors to cross a bridge and be included into something. Instead, we wanna embrace a race radical perspective that questions the nature of the bridge, questions what's on both sides of it, questions whether who wants to, to be included into that. Should that have ever been produced in the first place? And how does being included into it reproduce its violence? And so what else could we be up to? What other worlds could we be creating? And how could our language struggles be connected to that kind of an effort? And so we're thinking critically about the ways that uh, linguistic struggles can be tied to debates about migration and really asserting migration as a fundamental human right. But we wanna be really careful about the ways that, that uh, simply expanding access to citizenship uh, can misunderstand the, the nature of uh, citizenship as a, a racist system, a fundamentally racist system. And so we can see as the Black Lives Matter movement and various uh, racial uh, justice movements and, and uh, in, in reality, black power movements uh, and uh, uh, various sorts of political struggles have demonstrated that you can be a US citizen and still be fundamentally disposable as a second, third, and fourth class citizen and so on. So citizenship is not enough. And I worry about the ways that uh, our promotion of multilingualism and the inclusion of migrant populations or the expansion of immigrant rights um, often champions access to citizenship without interrogating what citizenship is all about fundamentally in spaces like the United States, in spaces like Canada, especially settler spaces when citizenship is built on top of indigenous populations. And so we wanna think really critically about uh, uh, anti-indigenous, uh, 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 anti-colonial struggles and, and efforts towards addressing uh, a range of forms of anti-indigeneity. So the anti-Dakota uh, access pipeline struggle here in the United States and the, the destruction of various uh, indigenous ecologies. Um, so what's it look like to think about a vision of language struggle and language learning that is engaged deeply with these broader sorts of projects? Um, I want to conclude by just pointing to uh, various sorts of studies that you could look into if you're interested that have uh, built on these uh, notions of racial-linguistic ideologies and racial-linguistic perspective and uh, racial-linguistics over the last five years. And it's been so exciting to see um, the emergence of all of this work that's looking at uh, educational context and, and teacher education context. It's looking at literacy practices and language socialization, thinking about disability, uh, thinking really critically about labor, uh, trying to, to figure out how policy is central to uh, uh, racial linguistic ideologies and educational classifications, thinking about uh, uh, how racial linguistic ideologies articulate in relation to Islamophobia and, and religion, uh, uh, trying to understand perception, social media, popular culture, and analyzing racial linguistic ideologies on a global scale. So you see in the bottom right, does Finland need racial linguistics? Absolutely. And you know, our European colleagues are grappling, are grappling. Uh, well, I should say our, our European colleagues of color have always known Europe was deeply racialized. And you know, the rest of the world is sort of saying to Europe, where do you think race came from? 
And so this idea that that Europe is somehow outside of these these uh, issues or that that racism racism is particular to the U.S. Canadians like to tell themselves that too. Uh, um, so they participate in that uh, that kind of distortion as well. It's it's audacious in a settler society, uh, such a deeply colonial and racist society, uh, to see that sort of sentiment be normalized uh, and be taken for granted. So um, uh, if you're interested in reading more of my work on these issues, you can check out my monograph, um, Looking Like a Language Sounding Like a Race, or you can um, check out my uh, edited volume, co-edited volume with um, my colleagues in the Language and Social Justice Committee of the uh, uh, Society for Linguistic Anthropology, uh, Language and Social Justice in Practice. So both of those books came out last year. Uh, I look forward to, to future conversations. Uh, thank you very much.